Good morning, folks. Welcome to the next week of Thai webinars. I think we are in week seven of the lockdown. Uh, from this week on, I think we will talk more tactical, more operational stuff. And today, I have the pleasure of having Mr. Raj Nair with me, who is going to be sharing a quick survey that they have done, uh, a fairly detailed one. And there are a lot of inferences for startups, founders, and angel investors from this. A quick uh, introduction to Raj. He's a strategy consultant. He's an Amchi Mumbai boy from a long time here. He's the chairman of Avalon Consulting. Avalon does work on strategy, analytics, and business transformation. Uh, they've also got another company, which he's again a chairman on, called Germinate Solutions, which is uh, an AI-based solution for customer care and reputation management. There's a third arm for that called AGR Knowledge, which is basically business-to-business market research arm, and also they do allied business services for that. Raj has been the past president of IMC. He's also been on Thai Mumbai board until recently. Uh, he's an IIM, IIT Mumbai DTEC graduate, and he has done his management studies from IIM Ahmedabad. So folks, uh, the format for today is Raj will do his presentation for the first 40 minutes. So I would request all of you to hold on to your questions till he finishes his presentation. Uh, and then we will do an in-depth Q&A post that. Uh, so if you keep posting the questions from the beginning, uh, please repost them once he's done so that I can then get the chronology of uh, what I need to ask and how I need to ask. In case you don't understand a bit of acronym or some jargons, just post it immediately. And during his flow, I will button and ask Raj, what does that mean or something? But we'll, by and large, wait for the Q&A till the end of the session. So Raj, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Naveen. And good afternoon to all the young entrepreneurs, the more established startups, the mentors and investors in startups, fellow charter members from parts of the, different parts of the country, and the organizers at, at uh, Time Mumbai, who've been working relentlessly for the last two months to produce one good event after the other. I don't know how they managed to do it, but congratulations to them. And welcome to all of you again. The, let me share the screen, which I'm going to use. Uh, can you um, yeah, yeah, you can. to do it? Yes, yes, you can do it now. Okay, we're ready to go. The topic of today's presentation is the world has tipped. Are you prepared? I'm not just going to figure out whether you're prepared or not, or help you figure that out, but also give you a, a framework for action. Otherwise, what's the use of sitting through half an hour or one hour of, of, a, of a webinar, unless we have some framework for action. As you can see the fruit on the right, what, what it looks like from outside is not what is inside. And that's what we have done. We try to understand what is really happening during this COVID crisis, what's happening to companies and what's likely to happen to them. Uh, so that you can figure out what you should be doing with your own startup or your own company. And uh, you know, it is uh, Warren Buffett who was credited, who was credited to have said, it is only when the tide goes down or goes low that you know who's swimming naked. COVID-19 has exposed a lot of people and you can see them naked. In fact, on a lighter vein, day before yesterday during a Zoom call in Brazil, which uh, the participants included the president of Brazil, one of the participants was sitting, let's say in the buff, and he got up by mistake and exposed himself. I think a lot of companies are exposed themselves during this COVID too. Um, let's face it, things have changed for good. Things will never be the same as before. When the tide rises again, what you will see is that the world is looking different. It looked much better than it is today, but it looked different. It will not be like what it was in 2019. Well, uh, from 2018 onwards, I've been anticipating a problem a big problem to arise, and I can go to, uh, into details of that some other time. 
And I watched it growing in 19. And in December 2019, when I sat down to write down my next year's note, I prepared an annual note for my clients and for my associates and friends, in which I describe what's going to happen globally and to India in the coming year. So on the 1st of January, when I was giving, uh, writing my note, I felt that this time I need to write it in two parts for the first time. So I had part one, the tipping point part one, which was really a set of things that the government of India should do because the previous two years were miserable for the Indian economy. I'm using the word miserable intentionally because the, we had started feeling the effects of many mistakes that the Supreme Court had done, the various state and central governments had done, and so on and so forth. And a lot of private sector companies have also contributed to the mess, but we were not in a good position. And there was something required to be done in the budget without which we would be less prepared for when the world tipped. So the first part was about that. And I said, I will write the second piece in February because I wanted some more time to look at data uh, to see how this thing that is happening in Wuhan is going to evolve and where is it likely to reach. And uh, tipping point two written in February was quite scary. It was, uh, for some people, found it scary, but that's what you're now seeing. This is almost like when the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico 165 million years ago and destroyed all the dinosaurs and except the birds and a whole lot of other living creatures. For years there was darkness. The sulfur which was thrown off from the impact of the, um, of the asteroid actually caused huge fires around the world and they say there were volcanoes too. But in any case, the world was blanketed with smoke and darkness for two or three years. And then you know that it was not doom after that. It brightened up and there was another world in which those creatures which were agile were able to survive and then evolve after that. You're going to see something like this. It's not going to change in the next one month just because the lockdown is going off. There will be difficult periods. You have to figure out how to survive. And then after that, it will be good. And it will be very good for those who are going to evolve to the new normal. Okay, well, let me give an example. Take a look at uh, what's happening in the US to the airline industry. In February, it was all fine. In March, when I wrote the paper in February, it was all fine. In March, it started tanking. And today, uh, the share prices of, of airlines is anywhere between 48% down in the case of Lufthansa to 73% down in, in the case of the giant airline, United Airlines. And in the meanwhile, Something else has zoomed up. Probably the, uh, I must give credit to the founder to have selected the name like Zoom. That is 129% of what it was. So this is what's going to happen. Uh, companies were really developed and ready for the new world will suddenly start zooming and will be rewarded heavily. And those who are dinosaurs and are like huge tanks, which are difficult to move, or like let's say aircraft carriers, which are difficult to maneuver in this ocean, they're going to have a tough time. So the world is going to change. And if you don't believe it, let's refer to a, a survey done recently uh, between the 15th and 19th of April by the Young Presidents Organization, the global survey of 3,500 CEOs. <coughs> what they reported was 11% of these CEOs fear that their business is not going to survive this period of darkness. Only 89% felt that there will be life after that. And most of these people who were skeptical about their future were those in, 40% were in the hospitality and restaurant sector, which has taken a big hit. And the world for restaurants is going to be different. The world for, hosp uh, for hotels is going to be different because the norms will be different and the number of people traveling across to for meetings will be different. Of course, the leisure travel will pick up again. 40% of the CEOs said that they expect their revenues to drop by 20% per year. Honestly, I think that's bravado. A much higher percentage will lose more than 20%. But let's come to India because India was most severely locked down unlike 
some other parts of the world, and this is a global survey. What I want you to understand is see, COVID-19 didn't kill businesses. It's a lockdown that killed businesses. COVID-19 didn't kill, people wanted to buy, people wanted to manufacture, but they were told you can't manufacture and you can't get out of their houses and buy. The, a prolonged period of this lockdown creates problems for recovery. And some people do not have the wherewithal to stay, stay alive during this period. And we did a study, which I'll describe a little later, but I just want you to understand that as a lockdown eases, you'll find demand coming back in many, many sectors. It will come back much later for other sectors and what will eventually settle will be slightly different from what it was in 2019. We are all reading every day and there are some TV experts who become uh, epidemiologists who are saying that by August or September we might have the first uh, vaccine. The a famous physician who is now the uh, probably going to be taking over as the head of World Health Organization, he is now the a special envoy on COVID-19, he says, vaccine unlikely in two years. This is what he said on 11th of May. Okay. There, will be, there are more than 100 candidates being developed. Some will be successful, some will not be. Those who are successful need to be, uh, first of all, go through a, lot of, a long period of trials, which are now curtailed to three months or four months. They'll be allowed to have limited uh, delivery. And by the time you and I and every one of us gets it, it'll be two years. So let's prepare for that two years. If it comes faster, great. But let's be optimists in that sense that let's hope it comes faster, but let's be realists and see how do we need to deal with this period when the darkness is not yet lifted. So the two base, basic questions I'm going to answer. Will India Incorporated, that is all the business, be able to deal with this lockdown and the effects of the lockdown? And second is, what can startups and small businesses do? I'll, this. You know, when you are a patient, let me just, when you're a patient and you come to me as a doctor, what will I do uh, and to see whether you're going, you're going to survive this coronavirus, whether you really have coronavirus? I first check whether you've got a good immune system. Second, whether your general health parameters are okay and that you don't have any comorbidities like uh, a cardiac problem or a pulmonary problem or any such problems which can impact your overall health. And the third thing I'll try and ask you is, where do you stay, by the way? Are you living in the crowded um, Dharavi slums or you're staying in a less, much safer area like Chembur? So if you're going to be uh, operating from the slums, you're going to have greater likelihood of of, of facing, of getting affected by, by the virus. So the same approach was taken to understand what's going to happen to India Incorporated. So we looked at three parameters. Cash resilience is the equivalent of, of immune system. Uh, profitability is, a, is the equivalent of general health parameters. And sector impact tells you where, which way you live. So what we did is we used three parameters to understand whether Indian companies are immune. We looked at 1,563 companies for which data was available in com completely in early April and analyzed them. We just took out all the, in the 1,563 companies, we do not have any uh, banks and uh, financial companies because it leads to unnecessary autocorrelation. If you understand what that term means, it, it just vitiates the analysis. Okay, so we just took three, these 1563 companies. They were large companies, they were small companies, they were medium limited, com medium sized companies. The small companies are sometimes probably bigger than some of the startups we are talking to today. But the lessons you can learn are the same. So we looked at cash resilience in terms of how much cash and cash ex equivalents you have at the start of this COVID crisis. And if you divide that by the amount of fixed cost, this shows you how long can you survive without any revenue? Okay. We also looked at how leveraged you are, which means how much debt do you have compared to your own, own funds? So if you're highly leveraged, it just takes a small dip in revenue to knock you off the pedestal. On the other hand, if you are under leveraged or under borrowed, in case there's an absolute necessity, you can borrow more. The third parameter we looked at was earnings before interest and tax and divide that by interest because 
you know, we want to see how capable are you to keep on paying the interest even if you cannot repay the principal because repaying the principal, banks have no problem. They'll reschedule it for you. But if you don't pay your interest on time, it's cardinal sin. So with these three parameters, we looked at what's the situation. And we found that, or well, let me explain uh, all the other parameters. Of the profitability, we looked at the EBITDA, that is earnings before interest, depreciation and tax. That's the cash profit you're earning, generating. Because that shows that if you, whether or not, you can manage to survive in case there's a lot of pressure from your customers who say, okay, I am not able to buy your services, your products, they're very good, but I need a 10% discount or a 12% discount or what have you. And most of you have probably had that conversation. Now, if you don't have enough cash profit, you cannot offer that discount. Or if you're already um, making a loss, you have a bigger problem. The other aspect we looked at is a very important health parameter that is return on capital employed. How much is your margin divided by the investments that you made in short term assets and long term assets? The total investment. If that is low and lower than the cost of borrowing, that means it's better to leave the money safely in the bank than run a business. If it is high enough, then if, the pre, if there is a pressure on, your, on, on you from customers or because of competition to reduce price, the margins will still be adequate to give you a decent return on capital employed and manage business. So if your business model is wrong then already, then you have a problem. If your business model is wrong, you can actually try and do something about it. And finally, whether you are in Dharavi or in Chembur or any other difficult area computer, is a is which sector are you in? Some sectors are going to face huge impact on revenue. I give an example of, of, uh, of airlines which suffered a huge impact negatively. I give an example of Zoom, which helps you to telecommute. I mean, you're all here using Zoom. Uh, then the impact is good for you. The other parameter we looked at, if you were in a particular sector, how many quarters is it going to take for that sector to go up, to recover. So if you're in the wrong sector, no matter how good you are, you're going to uh, take time to recover and do you have the money to recover. So this is what we try to do, exactly the way you would diagnose a human patient. Uh, when you look at the cash resilience, it looked comfortable. Comfortable in the sense that about half the companies had adequate score on cash resilience. Uh, the other half, had a problem. I'm not saying everything is good because it's like saying your head is in the in the freezer and the leg is in the oven and therefore on an average you're okay. If you are on the on the low cash resilience side, you need to do something about it. But as an economy, it's a balanced situation. But when you look at the profitability, that's there the bad news is. We have set little high bars for determining whether the profitability is good enough or not because you know that you have, you'll be under pressure for price and margin. About only one in five companies in India, out of the 1,563 companies, are in a position to withstand extended lockdown. I'm glad that some of the rules have been reduced from today or from yesterday, and hopefully they don't extend it to August. If it's extended to August, the whole economy is gonna crater, but then unfortunately the government's not gonna do that. And slowly will we come back to work, but even for a lockdown continuing to 31st May, we suspect that only one in five companies is profitable enough to say no problem. Majority of them are okay. About three fourths of them are, have a problem. And when it comes to small companies, 85% have a problem of profitability. I suspect it might be in the high 90s in the case of startups. So we'll come to what we need to do. But that's the situation when you look at cash resilience and profitability. Now, when you look at the sectors, we find that 70% of the companies in India whom we have studied, and those 1,563 companies account for a very, very large percentage of India's business because it covers large, middle, and small. They are likely to witness at least 25% dip in revenue and will take at least two quarters to recover. So 70% of the companies are going to take, have a hit of more than 25% in 
which means it could be as high as 50% or 70% also. And they'll take at least two quarters, which means we have come across companies who are going to take eight quarters or nine quarters to recover. So it's not a good scene. Now, when you go to the doctor, it hardly helps if the doctor says you don't have too much temperature, but I feel something funny when I press your stomach and you've got a little blood pressure. You want to know what's the total impact or what do I need to do, what's wrong with me. So we combined all these factors together to get a holistic view. Uh, I'm a strategy consultant and a management consultant love to use three by three matrices. So here's a three by three matrix. In this matrix, I have on the horizontal axis, the X axis, the se sector impact. So if you have a low impact sector, the medium impact sector, the high impact sector on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis, we have three layers of companies. The lowest layer, which are greenish in color, these are sectors where the profitability is high and the cash resilience is also good. But some of them may be in low sect impact sectors, some may be in medium impact sectors, and some are high impact sectors. As you can see the number of companies uh, in each of the sectors. And if you look at the middle sector, middle layer, you have companies where there is low profitability and low cash resilience, which means there's trouble. And some of them are in low sector impact sector, which is okay. Some of them are in a medium impact sector, not so okay. And some of them are in a high impact sector is bad news. Let's take the high, upper layer, uppermost layer. Here we have companies which have either low cash resilience or low profitability, not both combined. And they are in low impact sectors or medium impact sector or sectors which are impacted. So if you look at the four cells which are marked in the dotted um, red dots, uh, the, the dashes, they account for 950 of the 1,563 companies, which is 61% of the sample, are in high or um, medium impact sectors. And they're also stressed either or both in terms of cash resilience and profitability. So that's the bad news. Don't get cowed down by bad news because, as I said, the darkness will go away but we need to do something to be able to survive the darkness and win in the post-darkness period. But the good news for some people is that there are some companies which have very low impact and some, some sectors which have low impact and they're also in, have high profitability and high cash resilience. I hope some of you are in that sector. Only 107 companies, 103 companies in India out of this 1563 are in that cell. It's only 7%. So 93% are not that lucky. <clears throat> Be able to. We have a larger analysis. I'm only sharing a, a, a summary of it. The larger analysis, we have identified which company by name is in each of these cells. Uh, the purpose of this sec analysis is not to tell you which shares to buy and which shares to sell, but to decide for you, if I use the same framework, where do I fit in? And then wait for the next few slides to tell you what you need to do. It's all very well to have a diagnosis. Uh, just in case you're interested out of, uh, imp uh, out of, purely out of interest, which are the companies in the high impact, low impact sectors? Uh, clearly telecom and associated ecosystem, which includes Zoom and others, uh, or, or OTT companies like Alt Balaji and Netflix and others are doing extremely well. They're not impacted. Among those who are low impact are FMCG, agribusiness, e-commerce, education and so on and so forth, IT, ITS, they'll all recover packaging. Medium, the high impact are auto, auto ancillaries, aviation, capital goods, metals and so on and so forth, and some amount of real estate. So let's go on to what do we need to do, okay? There are some generic solutions which are applicable irrespective of whether you're, uh, which of the cells you're in, and whether you're not in the 1563 and you're small startups, these are important solutions that you have to apply. Because when it's darkness, everybody needs light. You can't say some people need light, some people don't light. So this is, these five things are only the light that you need to shine. Okay, conserve cash. When I say conserve cash, I say throw out your annual operating plan. Forget about the plan you gave to the VC. If the VC says, what about your performance? Say, go to hell. Uh, I have got a different thing to do. 
during the darkness. I am going to conserve cash, which means I have a weekly cash budget, a weekly cash budget, which show which has which payments am I going to make, which companies am I going to get receipts receivables from, and make sure your people are chasing those companies two weeks from before the payment is due. And then a daily cash monitoring. That means every day the CEO sits down and looks at the cash position and sees how much money came in yesterday, how much is expected today. And only if cash flows are going as per that weekly budget, are you going to make the planned payments? Or do you hold up the payments? You cannot afford to start with 20 lakhs cash on at the beginning of the week and end up with 12 lakhs at the end of the week. That's not on, except for the month and the monthly salary week. That week you will have negative. Overall, you have to come back to where you were. So it's weekly cash management, absolutely essential, whether you're a large company or a small company or a startup. Second, remember, profit is not your goal this year. Your goal is to survive and survive comfortably and be able to fight tomorrow. So don't do any bravado to try and increase profits. If a customer comes and says, I need a, a, a discount, uh, try and see that you can accommodate that customer to the extent possible because it's going to give you revenue. When I say extent possible, it meant that the price you're paying, you're prepared to ask for, or whether the customer is prepared to pay you, is more than your variable cost. So it means every unit you sell generates a little contribution which helps you to pay or to de defray some of your fixed costs. It's not total profit you're looking after, you're looking for marginal profit. Okay? Uh, Cut your fixed costs to the bone. <clears throat> if you have figured out how to work from home, don't insist on everyone coming back to work. In fact, you can cut down your office. We as a consulting company are not uncomfortable. But we have decided not to go back to our offices. We're giving up all our offices period. We have developed technology solutions which are very easy. And we have developed social impact solutions. And there are about 19 solutions which we're implementing. In fact, we're now implementing it for clients to see how to actually go to work from work home. So that the great feel of oneness and team and this and that is also maintained. So cut your fixed cause. You really don't need an office. I'm sorry if some of you are in commercial real estate, I'm saying, speaking against you. But you guys also have to recognize that two years from now, you'll see a drastic fall in the number of companies which are going to ask for offices for place that will fall. And you can reinvent your business. We'll come to that separately. You rework your supply chain because some of your supply chain members may not be relevant to you. Uh, connect with your customers because their needs will have changed. Just as you're adjusting, they're adjusting. When they're adjusting, if you adjust your offerings to match that or help them in some way, you're likely to survive. Retool your business for the new order. A lot of the parameters that you're using for running your business will change or retool. So this is, as I said, shining the light in the darkness. These are not specific solutions, but definite solutions which you always require irrespective of who you are. Now let's go to specific cost. I'll go back to my favorite three by three matrix. If you are in the lowest band from left to right, you are in a position to pursue market share. Don't sit back and say, I'll just defend existing customers. Because that's what most companies have to do. You're going to if you have cash, without busting your balance sheet, go and try and acquire companies. Go and acquire market share if not acquire people. Go hire great people from others who are uh, shaky, who are closing down. Support critical vendors like the Tata Group. Some companies apparently have told most of the vendors that instead of uh, paying you in 45 days, we're going to pay you in 90 days. And some of the weaker, smaller vendors, they've said, okay, instead of paying you 45 days, We'll pay you in 15 days so that you survive. Some smart solutions. And then focus on customers. You can afford to even do customer acquisition. However, if you're in the middle band, you have to raise capital now. It's not whether you're a big company or a small company. Look at Reliance. What are they doing? They're raising capital and like there's no tomorrow because they've got a huge amount of debt. As I said, your immune system is in poor shape if you're over leveraged. They are highly leveraged. But in 15 days' time, they actually took away half the debt. And don't be surprised if they become debt-free in a, another few weeks. It's your job to do that. Raise capital through whatever means, including debt, if you can borrow. Explore partnerships. 
a partnership could be with a customer, a partnership would be with a vendor, it could be with another player in the field, and together you might be stronger. It could be with some other companies uh, who are like dinosaurs who will die soon because they're still running their business like a 19th century company or an early 20th century company. They need to get digitized. And if you offer them a channel, a new digital channel or a different digital way of doing business uh, anywhere in the supply chain, uh, they might find it useful to, in, impl to invest in you. In fact, uh, during my last day, on my last day as the president of IMC Chamber of Commerce, organized a, a, a event where we brought large companies and smaller startups like many of you together on the same platform to explore how you can work together and be actually very useful for each other. So think along those lines and see whether there are large companies in the business who can actually benefit a lot by partnering with you. Do it now. Do also have to review a customer mix because some customers may not need you, you may not need some customers. So focus on the customers that are relevant to you when now and in the future. If you're on the topmost layer, focus on key customers. Do whatever you can, keep in touch with them every week, every other day, and see what you can do for them because don't be outside their line of sight. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of mind, out of sight. And out of sight, out of business. Try and retain your market share. Don't be ambitious to go and grow market share. That's for the people in the lowest, the lower, the bottom line uh, layer. Your job is to retain your market share so that you survive today, live tomorrow to battle another day. Raise capital, raise capital, raise capital, raise capital. That's the most important thing you need to do because you've got low cash resilience and your profitability is also low. If you start lowering your prices, your profitability will go for a six. You need some cash to survive. Because I'm saying at the end of the day, when the curtain rises, when the light, uh, the darkness goes, there will be business. And at that time, you want to be strong enough to live and fight. It's not just to survive, not to prevent death, but to be a new kind of a thing. As I said at the beginning, the only kind of dinosaurs that survived were the birds. They adapted very fast, evolved rapidly. And actually, the crow and the sparrow are all well, their ancestor was a dinosaur, but they didn't die. Okay, now let's uh, see what you can do as an investor or a mentor to startups. Because investors and mentors have a huge role to play, the startups need help. One is guide them in cash conservance, how to conserve cash. Get out of the spend and plan the next round mindset. I know that as an angel investor, as an early stage investor, you're very keen that the investee company goes and raises capital in the next year or two so that it gives you an exit or better valuation. Just get them out of that mindset, even though you've been pushing them in the past. You're probably not pushing them now, but please help them get out of that mindset because they trust you. Work, let the CEOs focus on business and then the issues which I talked about a few minutes ago. Second, do workshops with them on what levers they can pull to generate cash because you are experienced and you can bring your experience to bear on them. What to, which lever to pull, which pillar to leave alone because earlier they pulled other levers. Help them in this weekly budgeting and daily monitoring because you know how to do it. You've done it. You're there today as a mentor or as an investor because you've been there, seen it, done it. Help them to cut fixed costs because many people are very scared to cut fixed costs. And figure out ways to variableize some of your fixed costs. From a fixed cost basis, go to a variable cost. There are ways to do it. And please convince them. If they don't need an office, don't have an office. Work from home is a new normal. Even large IT companies for whom security matters a hell of a lot are saying very openly that they're not going back to, at least in two or three years time, only 25% of them will be working in offices, the rest will be working from home. And even the rest will be coming to office once a week or twice a week or whatever is as required. Second, help them to raise capital now. Tell them it's okay to dilute equity or to borrow. But help them there. Third, you're in a great position to engineer partnerships, whether they are B2B partnerships, that is managed with incumbents who are threatened by the startup world or managed with Others to become smarter. If you're, if you're 
Venti is in the B2C. Help these B2C customers, companies access customers by bypassing conventional channels. So if you help the B2C customer companies survive, your startup which works for B2C companies can help, can succeed. Same way for B2B to C companies. You know exactly what to do. You're smart guys. That's why you're investors and mentors. And these startups look up to you for help, provide that help. What I'd like to do now is open up the, 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 the I'll stop sharing and open up that meeting to discussion and questions. I promise um, Naveen that I will speak not for more than 40 minutes and I'll answer as many questions as possible. I do not mind staying on a little longer if required, but ideally let's start on time and end on time. Okay. Um, Naveen, over to you. Yeah, Raj. I'm just looking at the questions. So people, I request you all to start uh, sending us your questions based on the presentation. So we have the first question from Sanjay Deshmukh. Uh, he's saying that uh, social distancing seems to be overhyped. What is your take on it? I don't think it's overhyped because we don't know what causes what causes the virus to, to be so deadly. We do not have a medicine as yet and we do not have a, 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 a vaccine. So we don't know how to cure and we don't know how to prevent and we don't know how the hell it's happening then it's better to be safe. And you can actually operate despite the fact that you're doing social distancing. Because for instance, in your office, there's no need for 100% to be there. And if half of them are working from home, social distancing is very easy in the office. The next question, Raj, is uh, on the migrant labor issue by Jagdish Belwal. Uh, they're asking, how is this going to affect the industries in the long term? Uh, in the long term, no. In the short and medium term, yes. In the short term, what's going to happen is, and it's totally chaos out there. Uh, the government has said, okay, now you can start factories. A friend of mine was telling me about the plight of a, of a, a builder in Mumbai. He had just got these workers whom he had protected all this while to now start working on a thing. And the meanwhile, the government has... Uh, Offices, officers are visiting the site and telling the workers, Baba, there are trains leaving. You can apply, go. If you miss the trains, then you're, you're, don't blame us. So on the one hand, you're telling them you can start operating. On the other hand, you're saying that, look, you can go. The trains are there, please go. How do you expect the companies to start operating? This is one aspect. I think left hand and right hand have to coordinate and that will happen. It's the initial chaos. The second thing is that um, when people go, and actually travel through miles and miles on foot or by auto rickshaw or by a cycle or whatever it is, they're not going to forget this nightmare very easily. So a few and we're going to have a shortage of labor in some sectors. A few of them will come back, but after they've gone, gone over the trauma. So we're going to have a period when we'll have not enough labor in the short term. In the medium term, they'll come. In the medium term, they will come. But in smaller numbers and in the long term, there'll be no problem. Raj, the next question, I think, uh, is to, a, to an acronym that you had used. What is T-I-L-D-A-R? Okay. Um, it's just a word uh, we coined out of the word tilde. It is one of the signs in the... It is a, we are trying to say, this, it's a methodology which you have created to help people to throw out the annual operating plans and create a new operating plan very fast. In 15 days, we are helping companies to, to rebuild their... Uh, annual operating plan with flexibility so that it is possible to actually follow the plan and succeed. Uh, today, if you don't, if you say throw off the old annual operating plan, which many companies are saying, and just you navigate in darkness, it doesn't help. You, you need a plan. I need a flexible plan. But how do you build a plan when everybody is away from work? There is a large telecom company in, in Saudi Arabia, which is a very difficult market to operate. They are an existing client of ours, so we were able to connect with 13 subsidiaries and the main holding company, change the plans of all the companies by looking at the impact of oil prices on uh, at various levels, ultimately impacting telecom. 
and some of the subsidiaries which are doing hardware work. Also, their own market, how their customers are behaving. Bring all this together, and a hundred managers are brought together to, at various Zoom meetings and we agreed on a plan and built a flexible plan in eight days. Normally, you'd say our oh, planning process takes three months. We are saying we'll do it in 15 days. That company we knew inside out, so we have a group we knew, so we could do it in eight days. But any company we can do it in 15 days, and that's the tiller process we have created. This is the word we are using. It's not in any textbook. Thanks, Raj. The next question is, uh, how do you see the future of air conditioning industry? Um, I don't see a problem in the future. What we are all worrying is that, okay, in a closed room, where the virus will all be trapped, we'll all die. The airline industry has started giving you a, a ray of hope. They seem to have added certain filters to make sure that uh, when the air is recirculated, those filters trap the, uh, the pathogens. And therefore, this uh, will not be a problem. The future for the air conditioning industry is if they can figure out how to put those filters and make sure that stale air goes out more rapidly and, and, and good air comes in. I don't see a problem. There's no technical problem. It's, if, it's a, if the science doesn't exist, there's a problem because when the, when the science in any industry is discovered, it takes 12 years for a product to hit the market. You know, there's a study which shows that it takes 12 years from the lab to the final product if it's a commercially good product. But here the science exists. So there's no problem for the air conditioning industry. Okay. Even movie halls can modify the air conditioning. Science exists. Very interesting. And so can restaurants and uh, yeah. Yeah. party halls, I think. But they need to invest in the new science. The next question is from Sunil. So he's saying with work from home, what's the relevance for large corporates? And what do you see in the future for a financial hub like Mumbai? Okay, let, let me answer the first question first. And first. Uh, how does it matter whether you're a large company or a small company? You're using floor space. You're making employees travel and commute for two hours a day. In some cases, three hours a day. If, you're, if you've got an office in Nariman Point and your employee stays at Kandivli, and he drives to work, it's three and a half hours. Okay? So why do you want to torture them just because you're a large company? Second, um, you know, this whole um, concept of uh, travel is tiring. Now your employee is able to sit and save that time and use it for exercise, for family, and so and he doesn't have tiredness. The third thing is that he doesn't have to buy food for outside. He is home food. He saves money. It's good for his health. So it's good for the people. What's the problem? Just because they're large, you have to have a problem. Second, it's good for the environment. The whole idea of work from home in our company started at the very early stage of the COVID virus, a lockdown, looked out at the sky and said, wow, I can see birds, I can see the sky, I can see, it's no more gray. You know, Bombay was gray for a long time. And at night I could see stars, just saw in my childhood. I said, this is wonderful for the environment and we should figure out a way to not commute like this. It's good for the government. The amount of money they spend on highways if they spend a fraction of it on creating broadband highways, it'll be great. They save money, it's great for the employees, companies. So I'm saying it's good for everybody. So what's the problem? Big or small, you can do it. If you're big, you have benefits even more. Now, is it going to impact financial hub? No. The technology is there for everyone to use, whether it's for storage, for analysis, or for transacting. It's perfect. In fact, I would think that it would do good for Bombay as a financial hub. Now, customers who want to benefit from Bombay as a financial hub don't have to be in Bombay. They can be in Agartala. They can be in, uh, in Srinagar. They can be in Trivandrum. And yet, participate and use Mumbai as a financial hub. Till now, you had to be in Mumbai or its or, uh, surrounding towns to be used Mumbai. So, I would say, if you look at it properly, Mumbai can become a stronger financial hub if work of a mom starts. Very true, Raj, because both NYSE and NASDAQ today are completely being operated by employees sitting at home. Yeah. The flooring, I mean, the trading floor is no more uh, operated. It's not required. It's only in our mind where we are stuck with something. Take it out and you're in a great new world. The next question, I think, uh, is a slightly gendered one. So somebody is asking, Karthik is asking, if I were to look at multiple opportunities 
right now in this current situation is there a model that you can recommend to evaluate them uh, see the evaluation model has not changed all i would say is put an overlay of the three things i said is the com company immune to the virus does it is it healthy enough and set a little higher benchmark to decide what is healthy what's not healthy and see which sector the place is the sector is going to have trouble and it's going to take 3 years wait for 3 years and invest in that look for a, a, a opportunity where the sector is going to rise there's nothing called the economy is going to have a v shaped recovery or a w shaped recovery or u shaped recovery or l shaped recovery it's different sectors which will have different types of recovery the next question is uh, from a person parish he is saying that we are a training company how do you see the future of training on digital platforms i love that question because now i can I train customers anywhere i don't need a, a training room i don't need to uh, to uh, offer it only to people who find it convenient to come to my training center i can offer to anybody in the world i can even offer training to somebody sitting in Reykjavik it's wonderful you not you now need to figure out how you're going to market your training services because creating credibility on first of all reaching people the may is different creating credibility is different creating um, and creating credibility in different markets is different because people respond differently so you got to figure that out but on the delivery side there's no problem it's on the on the on the marketing side you have to figure out and there are solutions so raj i think you need to do a separate session on go to market strategy for a borderless world i think that's okay it. okay moving on to the next question uh, what's your take for companies into lifestyle products how do you see them do after lockdown uh, let's differentiate the immediate uh, future to the longer term future in the long run there is no problem people the virus will be over people will go to work people go to shop people want to spend they will spend people earn money and they spend now your question should be keeping the long term in mind what do i need to do in the short term don't expect people who are shell shocked to start spending money like they used to spend earlier or let's say they might some of them will spend as much as before but the number of people will be spending like that will be less in the beginning trim your expenses trim your fixed cost and see that you're okay and you're still surviving and making a little bit of money during this period when lesser number of fewer number of people are coming and buying those of uh, lifestyle products uh, as long as people are alive there will be lifestyle products okay but right now they have to recover from the blow they got hit and if you figure out some nimble ways of doing it you will win i'm very optimistic i suppose if i was not an optimist i couldn't have uh, become a an entrepreneur at the same time unless i'm a realist i will not be able to advise any a company as a consulting uh, as a strategy consultant true so shrinivas has the next question for you raj the question is uh, are companies expected to innovate aggressively to look for additional sources of revenue like consulting based on domain expertise and things like that uh, well let me ask uh, answer the generic question first will they have to innovate absolutely innovate not just to find a new source of revenue but even the existing source of revenue unless you innovate your dead because you need innovative ways of delivering your innovative solutions because your customer has changed the customer's needs have changed so if you want to earn from the customer who has changed you have to be innovative there's no question in terms of in terms of consulting well domain expertise is not an innovation it's been there for a while because the days of generalist is over in the last 15 20 years it's the people who had domain knowledge in addition to general consulting skills who have survived and grown going forward you probably have to have a sharper mix of that and innovation thanks so next we have a question from our favorite returning person sharad uh, is a regular in all our webinars so he's asking what is your take on venture debt as a way to raise funds for the current scenario and then there's a additional question to that 
and particularly if if it's in the msme micro segment then do you think debt from bank is a better option instead of equity okay i'll answer there are a number of questions in this and shara thank you for becoming again and again to the tie webinars because we need more of you so okay um venture debt versus normal debt so when you take venture debt it's a expensive form of debt compared to normal debt and uh, so it's only when you're not going to be able to get money from conventional lenders where conventional lenders i mean lenders who have to look for the value of the asset you're going to mortgage or hypothecate to them and they'll take a margin on it now if you're in a business where you don't have too many assets to give a security uh conventional lenders don't are not there to give in which case your choice is only to take uh, venture debt if you are in a position where your cash resilience is low the choice is between dying and and surviving so if you don't want to die and you want to survive and you don't have assets again which you can take borrowing you will take venture debt the venture debt guys are not bad guys it says that their source of income a uh, source of money is costly than the source of money of banks and they are willing to take a little risk on you okay it's another matter that they will invest in you only provided a venture capitalist has put some venture equity in it because they can go on the basis of the due diligence done by the venture investor so they are venture equity investor okay, have i answered the question yeah i think so you have okay. answered okay part 2 of the question is i think what the person is asking is if you're an msme then you have no other choice but to take it to get the funding from a bank and uh, if your idea product services solves a dire problem in the society then uh, infuse capital of future then rather than debt on early ventures i think she's asking or he's asking the same question okay so uh, let, let me put it in a slightly different way you're an msme uh, you're not necessarily a, a startup in the i'm saying suppose you're an msme and not one of the digital startups you could be an msme and a digital startup coach okay but even not a digital startup and you're a small company and you can only go to conventional things because you're not a, a promising uh, hockey stick type of growth with huge scalability and all that kind of stuff you're a conventional business small as and you deserve to exist because you play a important role in society okay so you have to borrow from banks but if banks are not lending and there are some new schemes the government of india is bringing you have to look for partnerships sometimes partnerships help you to help in the sense you don't need money then because they are able to bear some of the costs and uh, you're able to leverage off their assets or off their capabilities or off their price processes sometimes partnerships could mean equity investment so don't be shy of reducing your your uh, shareholding if the partner is going to bring in money and the partner is going to bring in knowledge if the partner is going to get you more access take it it's better to have a small share of a larger cake than a large share of a small cake which is shrinking got it i think uh, the person also agrees with you he ends off the line by saying equity brings confidence or else debts create stress the next question uh, how can small businesses imbibe social distancing and its consequence as a key consideration moving forward see is this social distancing first of all shouldn't worry us too much it's not forever okay you will you might still um wear a mask for some, next 2 3 years who knows uh till uh, medicine is found and a vaccine is found you still wear it and you may have to have less social distancing when i say distancing it means keeping a certain physical difference distance from people in a small company the challenge is that if you are sitting in an office and you you have a small tiny office of 400 square feet or 200 square feet and you got 20 people there my request to you is don't necessarily make those 20 people sit there there are so many ways whereby only four of them have to come you don't have to come every day it could be a different two people coming in you let them work from home there are so free technologies for doing it don't think that if they sit at home then all your secrets will go out you can build in all your uh, your, your security you can have a fancy office with thick concrete walls 20 inch walls instead of 8 inch walls and yet the money the, the data can be leaked through the laptop so what you need is technology to to provide security 
you don't need these large uh, walls and doors and all that. Um, try and see that you reduce the number of people who requ are required to do distancing, then it's not a problem anymore. If you're a manufacturer and you need to get people working, and uh, it's a small, let's say a small uh, gala, there are eight people, the total size of the gala is so small that it's impossible to keep distancing. See whether the process can be modified. I don't know the situation, so I can't give a general answer. But I know it's a bigger challenge than if it's an office. Thanks, Raj. So folks, buckle up now, because this is Raj's favorite topic and favorite question. So Raj, here it comes. What's your view on MSME package announced by the government? Any inputs on loan conditions and the pseudo equity through fund of funds? <laughs> you guessed right. I'm saying if you're an entrepreneur, don't depend on any MyBab from the government to help you. The first and foremost, you didn't, you didn't start an, a venture because you wanted protection of a large company or from the government. Think of them as some people who will lubricate the process of your success as who will help you to succeed and not, you don't depend on them. The government has its own way of doing things. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes they aim it at one sector, but actually the sector which benefits is something else. So um, sometimes uh, there are people who at the top who will design a great uh, plan to help MSME and startups. By the time the last man who prepares the rules has a say, it's impossible to use, use that benefit. Then they'll modify it. So don't get overjoyed because there is a scheme. Don't get depressed because the scheme doesn't work for you. Focus on your customers, focus on what you have and win. If a scheme is available, use it. But don't depend on it. You're an entrepreneur. You're smart, you'll find a way out. Don't depend on the government. That's a great answer, Raj. And also, I think Prasad's question is also answered because he asked the next question, which is, do we approach such schemes? And I think you've answered it very well. The next question is from Mac. I think it's, sorry, how dumb of me, but it's the Mac. Is, it, is there a good time to leave a predictable job and join a consulting shop? What's your views or should I wait for nine months? Yeah, nine months is what takes, uh, it takes to create a baby. But uh, in the case of creating, uh, reinventing yourself as a consultant, you don't need to wait for nine months. Uh, this is as good a time as any. If you are talented, if you have that hunger to find out what's wrong and what ca can I do to set it up and you're prepared to use a hand and, and not just pontific and actually hands and legs to, to go and help and implement, this is as good a time as any to join the consulting business. But if you use, if you don't want to, you want to just pontificate and talk about all the gyan you had in, the, in your past 20 years of experience or whatever it is, then consulting is not the place. Consulting is hard work, looking at data, especially now. So I'll tell you myself, I love data. I keep telling people that I love data because without data, I don't want to do a diagnosis. I like to look at data and understand what stories is telling me. I like to look at, listen to data and see hear the songs it is singing. Data tells you a lot. Unless you've, you've got a data mindset, consulting is not the place of the future. 15, 20 years ago, you could get away as a consultant by giving general gyan. Real good gyan. But today, there is so much data that people want precise solutions. You, have precise, you can have precise diagnosis, precise solutions. And then you should be prepared to work hard to implement it because there are huge HR challenges. You might come up with the right solutions, but there will always be someone who feels that why is this outsider coming and telling me I should have known the answer. So let me block this. Give 100 reasons why this is not implementable. But if you're able to carry people with you, if you're by nature someone who involves others, involve these people so they don't treat you as an outsider and you're part of the problem, you're, they're also part of the problem, you're part of the solution, they're part of the solution, you'll be very successful as a consultant. Welcome to our club. Thanks, Raj. Are you hiring, by the way? Uh, no, not now. Okay. So there's a question uh, from Agarwal, uh, our charter member. 
he's asking raj is there any special mantra for micro ventures to survive as against their larger competing brothers uh, within their customers landscape see the, uh, the, when i say micro i don't see small when i see micro i see nimble it's like the bird which survived birds were dinosaurs who survived they could evolve so rapidly they are not stuck in bureaucracy if they find a right a better solution in the afternoon they throw away the morning solution and work on it so as a micro enterprise the big advantage is that you can be nimble the big disadvantage is that you can get crushed by anybody walking past you so it's important that you stay in a zone where you're safe at the same time you are very very innovative and that customers notice you because when you are small you are not noticed but when they come out with something unique and go to a customer with a unique thing customer will say wow none of these big guys told me anything about this and they take you seriously raj how is social distancing going to affect the retail sector how is social distancing going to affect your voice can you hear me ah uh, sorry it was it was my connect oh. sorry uh, how is social distancing going to affect the retail post uh, lift up a um, very good question because i came across a, a solution uh, implemented by a chain in europe uh, it was not a retail thing it was a <clears throat> a restaurant chain which had a bigger problem at 60 restaurants apparently and they felt that because of social distancing even after they open up the revenue per square foot will drop so badly and i'm picking up this because revenue per square foot is also the mantra for retail the revenue per square foot will drop so badly for the next two years that they will die so what did they do they said look we are a restaurant we know how to buy all the food ingredients we are 60 restaurants in our chain so we know how to buy in bulk so why don't we convert ourselves into a, a retail chain which sells specialized food products we already have the vendors we only have to buy more from them because now we are not going to cook for ourselves there will be many people cooking at home so they actually expanded their purchase in 10 days they redesigned the shop in such a way that it was possible to for people to order online and just pick up and go they didn't have to walk around the stalls so the, the social distancing problem of retail was solved by saying you order and have it ready and packed up it will be put in a carton and kept for you just come and take it so they converted not only what would have been a conventional retail shop to overcome the the social distancing problem but they actually converted a a a, a food restaurant into a retailer specialized retailer which is successful apparently in two weeks time their revenue per day was higher than when they were a restaurant so forget about so it is testing they were actually a winner so if you think differently even retail can win what about malls then raj what happens in malls see malls had a problem for the last 10 years if you see in in the us one by one they were closing only in india they started rising at that time now unless a mall is a place for entertainment and not just for shopping why would people come there it is so convenient to buy on amazon it is so convenient even to get it from the neighborhood uh, store and the prices are now okay why would anyone want to go to a mall unless they want you provide it make it real fun many malls which are successful are already fun before this thing so you create entertainment create all kinds of things and don't think of yourself as a place you are selling things then malls can survive but otherwise malls are like dinosaurs that already started dying in the last 5 years or 10 years in the us and in europe they have to rethink their business they probably have fewer malls fewer outlets but they'll change their outlets many of the customers in malls are dying let's say jc penny um, so many of them are dying the malls those are going to be empty they have to figure out what to do okay it's not a real estate business anymore what's your viewpoint on the manufacturing sector 
if it can be a more specific question uh, because i could easily say uh, i think it's good because that's not the answer you're looking for so yeah. if i get a more specific question i can give a specific answer so that was the question and the next question was what's your take on wet lab research in academia wet lab research uh yeah i was talking to the director of iit bombay and he said his struggle is to manage 1800 uh online lectures a week but he said i'll overcome that but what about the things that are happening in my wet labs and in the workshops where people have to learn by doing things it's going to be a big challenge but i'm saying that uh don't think of the last 8 weeks as the next 8 weeks the next 8 weeks will see a different thing happening and you'll be actually able to go to the lab you'll take more precautions you'll probably stagger the timing if that lab was open for 8 hours a day 10 days now you'll have the lab open for over 12 hours or 24 hours or what have you or you'll operate the uh, the lab for 7 days a week and some have managed to see that in spite of social distancing in spite of taking all the extra care you're still able to operate i think for every problem there is a solution only if you say that oh big problem i put my hands up shoot me then no one can help you so last week eight weeks were a problem for uh, wet labs next question do you see the indian economy stabilize and recover us economy is expected to recover in 18 months what would be our lagging effect well as i said i'm an optimist i'm a realist i think they need economy to recover when it recovers it won't look like it was before this year i am expecting i'm not saying that uh, i'm not going to get into the detail explanation i'm expecting a minus 3 to minus 5 gdp degrowth degrowth okay it's not going to be a happy situation but the year after that you start seeing recovery and we will be and in in another 3 years we'll say oh did this happen Yes, the good thing that it happened because a lot of things we should have changed, but did not change all these years. But this forced us to change. Look at even the government reforms, which has been packaged as if it's a stimulus. Yeah, one one point five trillion dollars uh, rupees is a stimulus. The rest of it is actually a lot of good things that have been have been done. A lot of reforms which should have been done even without the virus is being done now. Uh, similarly. in every part of private sector also you start doing things which you should have done years ago but you'll do it now as a result uh, our business will look different a few years from now and uh, next no one can predict whether indian economy will be back in shape in 18 months or 24 months but yes tell yourself that three years is going to be difficult if it gets over in a year and a half great in my sector it might be just 6 months in somebody else's sector it might be 36 months which is like difficult to say for the country as a whole when but there are sectors which will, like logistics which will be in great shape in 6 months time so there also india so i don't want to give a blanket answer nor am i running away from answering the question so i think best is to say 6 months to 3 years as yeah. a the next question is uh, again this has been coming up in all our webinars what do you see the future of uh, reality sector i'll differentiate residential from commercial residentials will continue to grow there may be uh, a period when people might be a little more reluctant to buy there may housing finance companies might be more reluctant to lend unless you have got a secure job uh they will be little careful about bad debts but real estate will continue to grow if real estate in the residential sector has a problem it is because of not covid but because they, there was over supply even before that uh so they'll probably have to pause like they're doing right now and not go overboard in building more and more new ones but there will be one set in residential which is affordable housing which will always be uh, in good shape let's move to the commercial side commercial real estate i see a drastic change happening i see a drastic change for the simple reason that in the next 5 years i expect companies to have less offices and smaller offices and more of work from home and because of work from home a new mantra will a new catchphrase will be not 2 bhk or 3 bhk 
will be two BHKO. There will be a small space for an office. People will design off in such a way that there's a small silent area, and whether it's a cubicle or whether it's a whole room is a separate matter, but you'll create a niche for someone to work from home. And that's a change that's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm just predicting it's going to happen. For commercial real estate, I don't see why you need 20 branch offices just because you've got uh, 20 branches, uh, branch locations. You'll probably work out of a, work, a, a shared office, like a WeWork or Innovate or whatever it is. Um, have as much flexibility as possible. You'll tell people you, uh, if you're a salesperson, why are you coming and wasting time in the office? Go spend time with the customers or moving between customers. So there will be changes which will impact commercial real estate negatively. Now, if, if commercial real estate manufacturers are creative, they'll figure out good solutions. Two questions leading to this. One is, do you think prices in Mumbai will come down? And do you think Mumbai is going to get less crowded? Mumbai is not going to get less crowded or less traffic jam. You just had to look at the wind, out of the window yesterday. I called out to the rest of my family. I said, look at the flyover. It's packed. There was a traffic jam at 5 o'clock in the evening. So, uh, it, much as I would love to see low traffic and environment be good, lots of birds fluttering about, it's not going to happen. We're going to get back to our wicked old ways, travel a lot. Right now, there's heavy traffic because public transport has not started. People are a little worried about getting into public transport. They'll take their cars, which are parked at home, and get onto the road. There'll be traffic in the roads. Uh, it's more chaotic than otherwise. But when public transport starts, the traffic on the roads will come down a bit. When people start working from home, more and more companies, like we have now gone into work from home. All offices closed. Okay? Uh, that many people, will, less will travel. So the, a lot of traffic is because of commuters, not because of shoppers. So if commuting starts becoming less in all parts of the country, and it will be a slow process, it will be like an S-curve. It's not going to happen overnight and say, hey, let's work. Some stupid fellows like us have taken a drastic step now. Maybe other stupid fellows will do it. And then after it, people will start saying, hey, these stupid fellows are not that stupid after all. Uh, we should also, why do we need 80% uh, of our people? They should work from home. Let's create the technology, give them free bandwidth, still cheaper. Thanks. The next question I think will be an interesting one and I'm sure you must have contemplated as an IMC president. What can India do immediately to attract forecasted global manufacturing shift from China? Okay, it might sound like a flippant answer, but I'm serious about it. Every ministry, the senior people who actually deal with potential investors should be given 10 days training in hotels. Okay. They learn how to welcome people, how to smile, how to serve. And then if we start implementing ways to get MNCs and other country companies to come and invest, they will be looking for solutions to solve their problems. Say, okay, you want to come? Uh, guys, I have this problem. This problem. Okay, I'll give it, leave it with me. I'll sort it out. I'll have the key in your room in 15 minutes or whatever it is that. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 1982, I was flying from Hong Kong to Taiwan and there was a, a gentleman in the business class next to me who was from New Zealand. He asked me what drink I'm taking and this and that. And then he asked me, where are you going to Taiwan? I said, I'm trying to explore on behalf of my customer some potential partnerships. So, he said, oh, and I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm coming back to start another company. I said, Another company says, I'll tell you my story. He says, three years ago, my wife and I came to Taiwan on a vacation. At the immig for immigration, we had to fill up what we are doing and what the, what the company I'm working for does. He says, when we finished immigration and we're going to the baggage counter, we were stopped by three uniformed people who said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, please step aside. And they said, look, we know you're here for a week. Oh, you're here for three days. Uh, we know that you're manufacturing this sort of stuff. We want you to come and set up a factory in Taiwan. Today, our director general wants to meet you. 
we know you're staying in this hotel. We've already extended your stay by one day. Hmm? And, the, and it'll be at our cost. The first day will be with us at our cost. We want to take you to a, a director general, come and meet you and pick you up in the hotel. And he will explain to you with his team and understand what you do and see whether you'll find it useful to start a factory in Taiwan. And then the next three days, all the, the, the tourism, touristy things you want to do will be on us. The car is provided for you. Okay. He was so scared because they were all military gear. He said, let me think about it. Then they went and talked to the wife and they proved their, their uh, credentials. And he says, I actually did it. And there was no doubt in my mind next day that I must start a factory there. I didn't come to start a factory. These are lessons to lay, learn from countries like Taiwan. Can we do that? I think you, if you send our senior government officials to spend 10 days as an intern with humility in hotels in India, our hotels, our five-star hotels are fantastic training grounds. We can solve the problem. So it sounds like a flippant answer, but I'm serious about it. You cannot have people invited when they come, they say, oh, this is the rules. You know, we can't change this. We can't do this. We can't do that. It's a go to hell. There are other countries in the world which are welcoming us. You're not the only show in town. This is a serious answer. Might sound flippant. No, oh, very true, Raj. Uh, in my previous role, I used to take companies from India into Ireland. All our role was managing itineraries. Right from the time we get a person boarded over here, to take him to Ireland, show him all the sites, take him to all the people, meet, write a project, get him the funding and come back. The FDI inward investment agencies work like some of the best McKinsey's in North. Yeah. That's how yeah. companies, you know, develop. Or Avalon's. Yeah, or Avalon's. <laughs> okay, the one more question, which is pretty much uh, a segue to this, is somebody's asking, if I'm a company looking into this potential shift, how do we develop skilled labor and, and how can we better the quality of China for the cost that they kind of incur? Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, skilled labor is not any worse than anywhere else. It's the kind of discipline we as managers and supervisors put on them. If you were to plan your thing and not accept Chalta Hai as a, a solution, the worker is not going to give you Chalta Hai. The problem is with us, Chalta Hai. We have to meet our target, Nikaldo. So if we take care of ourselves, the workers will take care of themselves. Okay, um, Our mindset is to change. And the new, as long as we say, look, I'm going to see a different world. I'm going to see new demand from customers. The customers, customers are going to see demands. Now let me be alert to that. Talk to them and understand what is it that they will value. And then say, I'll figure out a way to see that I can deliver what they value. Problem is size. Another question from uh, Chandru from Singapore related to this, but I think in the white collar sector is how do you see workforce strategy evolving to make enterprises thriving and surviving during these times? Chandru, you're Chandru Pingali? I don't know if it's Chandru Pingali. No, it's no, yeah. Ice Cube okay. admin. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he is the guy who uh, ran the HSBC, not HSBC, Standard Chartered uh, Outsourcing the BPO in Chennai? I think it is. Anyway, whatever it is. So, uh, can you repeat that question? I got distracted when I saw the name Ch Ch Chandru from Singapore. How do you see workforce strategy evolving to make enterprises survive and thrive during these times? Survive and thrive during these times. <clears throat> First of all, I believe um, it's, it's a problem with us, not with the workforce. Okay, the workforce is fine. How do we set up processes? How do we actually change things? How flexible we are and how we train them is all that matters. So uh, you are going to be, be, there'll be much more demands on you from your customers to change. If you're able to transmit that change to the workforce and yet see that they are not unhappy, you don't change, make them change in such a way that they're going to be in trouble just to satisfy your requirements, I think there, there's no problem. Thanks. Uh, 
another interesting question uh, related to workforce and everything do you see the trend of solopreneurs developing and and people becoming freelancers and and, and jobs being outs outsourced rather than having employees on payrolls yeah yes it's always it's, it's been there uh, as a very popular thing in uh, uk for instance in the last 10 years they were called sole contractors so there are people who work till the age of 40 and they say look i don't want to work in a large company i want the freedom i have skills then they make them some way available uh, on specific projects for different countries so um, that is a trend which already existed it will be a good trend good thing for companies now because instead of having fixed cost they can get expertise required it is like uber if i want supposing i were to sell my audi and my honda and say look i'm going to use only uber if i want to go to a nice place where i'm going to be seen stepping out i can book a uber which is a, a a nice black bmw if i'm going to the fish market i can get a uber go if i'm going to just go to office i can get a uber premium i can choose what i want so uh, if i have a fixed workforce of fixed managers i have to take what i have but now i can when i say i mean as a company huh? i can hire people who are just solo entrepreneurs who will be useful for the specific 3 month period or 5 month period or for a specific project however long and get the the benefit of such great people without having to hire them and keep them on their low roles for good so if people start thinking in that way in the new world i'm sure there's going to be a great opportunity the next question is again a segue into real estate what do you see for the, as the future of schooling do you think schools also will become totally online or kids i don't think schools uh, when i say schools i don't mean business school engineering schools i mean school as in school as we know here i don't think so uh, for the simple reason that when you go to school you're not just learning arithmetic and science and general science and civics and so on and so forth your being your character is being molded by the teacher there uh, your interest in a particular subject is being molded by some experiences you get you learn to to struggle with some bullies in class you learn to face so many things in life and learn to cooperate and work together and play games together because you are in school that experience will be missing if school is only online i would expect that there'll be a mix of online and offline i i can even see a school saying i don't have enough space saying you know what i'll do is i'll have three hour shifts of real classroom and another three hour of online so i can now take the double the number of school students without increasing the number of things uh, i mean those creative things will happen but it will be sad if we lose some of the benefits i'm a huge fan for online you know but i'm just saying it will be sad if we miss some of the great value that great teachers give you by coming and tapping you on your back and knowing that's the way to do things great or why don't you think about it this way individual attention as well as class attention zooming in up and zooming down you know that sort of thing which some good teachers can do online can't do yet maybe there'll be technology 20 years from now 5 years from now which can do that but till then i think it's a great thing to have a mix of both it's a social learning and a subject learning no raj i don't think bots will ever replace teachers huh? that's i don't see that future yeah. yeah yeah next question do you see massive deleveraging happening in all businesses and what will be its impact on growth and risk appetite in the future uh can you define deleveraging a bit more so that i get the right angle and also others also understand so can this person who asked the question be unmuted so he can ask the question what does he mean by deep leveraging uh, rahul can you see hemant a hemant can you just uh, raise your hand so that uh, my colleagues can identify you i can see one person named hemant gulati no this is hemant a maybe he must have dropped off yeah the I... part is that uh, i have 99 questions still and you know I don't think we have time for 99 question because so that, I must wind up in 4 minutes. Yeah, I know that's why I'm trying to club all the sector related questions together and asking. So the question that he's trying to ask Raj is that with now that people have discovered that if your business is highly leveraged 
uh, it, it can kind of come back and bite you. But at the same time, you know, leverage is, you require that leverage to kind of get the growth capital that you want and take risk and become profitable and grow into a large company. So do you see that scenario in the future sure. or do you see companies being a lot more? Okay. So I heard words like risk and leverage and so on and so forth. Um, when there is risk, that's the time when you don't do leveraging. All right. If you do le high leveraging at high risk period, you're, you're in trouble. Which is why when a startup is there in the first few months, you don't take loans, you take more and more equity. Because equity is low risk capital and uh, external risks are high. When you've gone past the stage where the risks are lower, that's the time you take equity, uh, but take uh, debt because you're able to absorb changes in revenue without getting killed. So I would suggest that uh, whoever asked the question, if they're in a risk phase and their revenue is at risk, don't try and take too much debt. If there is an option to take equity, if there's no option to take equity, there's a different situation. But look for partners, look for investors. Doesn't matter if you're if you if you get diluted a bit, or cut down your costs so that you don't need that much money. But taking a lot of debt at a time when the risks are high is not a great thing to do. What's your view on the automobile sector, both used and uh, unused cars? Uh, let me answer the question specifically to the, with respect to India. This is a long answer, uh, and therefore, this probably will be the last question. The automobile industry didn't change for so many years, and now they are in the throes of change, whereby there will become, you'll see more of hybrids and more of EVs coming. The path is clear, and the, the change will be rapid after a little while because battery costs are coming down, and uh, charging costs for batteries because of solar. Will Again, a whole lot of reasons why EV will start slow and it rapidly go up. So the automobile industry has a huge challenge because um, instead of having 10 or 15,000 parts, it will require fewer parts. As under the hood especially, <clears throat> you just need three key parts. Okay, The motor, the governor, and the battery. I'm oversimplifying it. There will be a lot of electronics to modulate it. But moving parts are going to change. So there's a huge internal change the auto manufacturers are going to face. Then the pollution as a problem will bite the IC engine manufacturers. That's, that is the companies which are manufacturing uh, petrol and diesel engines. It's going to get tougher and tougher. So life, the investments required to keep that uh, IC engine bus business continue will become tougher. So environmental consciousness has gone up a lot. The third thing is that in India, for instance, more than 90% of the cars are financed. If it's not financed, the demand falls. And commercial vehicles, probably 100% are financed. So unless the financial sector's health is good and are in a, in a position to advance money to the auto sector buyers, the auto sector is going to have problems. And I see that path going to be a little tedious in the next two years. It will get sorted out. But the number of people who can buy, uh, get loans will get reduced. Okay. So the auto sector is a problem. Auto sector has got another problem, which is because uh, the uh, people are delaying the purchase. There'll be another situation where you'll have used cars getting, uh, being sold more. There'll be a big, big demand for used cars because many people who are afraid of taking public transport will buy used vehicles, not necessarily cars, but two-wheeler business will go up significantly in the next few years. Because people say, look, I do want to take a taxi. Let me do this really safe. So these are a whole lot of factors that are going to work. So auto sector as a whole, there are challenges, there are good things, like the, the two-wheeler sector will go up. And there are some people who say, oh, the shared cars will have a problem. No, I don't think it's a problem because there's a solution already in place. Uh, there are ultraviolet bulbs which are available today. If you put it, I know it's bad for health. So what they do is when you get down in the car and then you're changing to the next next customer, the driver steps out, closes the door, keeps the ultraviolet light on for two minutes and it'll kill the bacteria or the pathogens and then you get into the car again. So there are changes that are going to take place. There's technology available. 
So everything is going to change. If you think that you want the old days back, you can sit and sing songs about the great old days, but the new days are going to be different. The new days are going to be exciting. There are going to be opportunities. What I want to remind, finally, uh, remind all of you is, uh, especially the younger people, is it does not matter where you came from or where you started from or where you're today. What really matters is where you want to go. So focus on where you want to go and you'll be successful. I want to thank each one of you and the organizers for this uh, opportunity to talk to you. I really enjoyed all the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Raj. Uh, Raj, there are plenty more interesting, very, very interesting questions. So what I will do, Raj, is maybe, you know, I'll take up these questions and do an interview mode with you sometime later and, and, you know, put it out there for the people. Okay. Uh, I would even go ahead to suggest one more thing. You can share my uh, personal email ID, not my company email ID, rajgovindnair at gmail.com. One word, rajgovindnair at gmail.com. I'll try and answer as many questions as possible. Give me time because there are three companies to run. There are lots of webinars. I've got another webinar to do on a different subject this evening. I've got a call from somebody else asking for one more on a third subject. So there is a fair amount of uh, pressure. On a time, there's no weekend. Uh, the day doesn't seem to end any day. But we as people who have been relatively successful, it's our job to help others. That's the whole credo of time. Okay. So... Uh, if there are some other charter members who also prepare to answer questions, we can distribute these questions to a few people. I'll answer some. Some people will answer some others. And we can help our community of entrepreneurs and startups and business people. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah. folks who are still on, uh, remember we do these one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions at least two times in a week. It is going to be three times where you're going to get 15 minutes what is say FaceTime with a uh, charter member who comes with a particular background. So go and ask them also, sign up for that. Uh, we are here to help you as much as possible. Uh, in fact, from this week on, our strategy in webinars is going to be more operational rather than yarn and hold and tight and stuff like that. I think all that is done right now. Let's get into the working mode of how do we get you out of this trouble and how do we make you stronger than ever before? So thanks again. Thank you, Raj. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again tomorrow in our session with Sanjay Mehta. Thanks, Satan. Bye. Bye-bye, folks.